Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the time this morning in worship, and thank you for the time with Robbie and Rose, for all the many ways in which we can share in the, the, the work of the Spirit and, and uh, see your hand at work in our lives. Father, that is such an encouragement and a reminder of the fact that you can do so much with so little. And we also know, Father, that the, the training ground, the opportunity to be prepared for that work, is found here and now in your word. And so we ask, Father, that you would take the time that we've made available to study this morning and turn it, Father, into our classroom at your feet, an opportunity to know you better and to hear your word as spoken to our hearts. And as always, Father, I pray we'd be thinking about how and where you would ask us to conform our lives to what we learn. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in Genesis chapter 3. I've been leading up to this chapter for two chapters worth of of discussion. And I don't just mean in the numerical sequence. I mean in the events of those first two chapters, we continually referred up to chapter 3, forward to chapter 3, because we saw so much of what God was doing in those first two chapters really foreshadowing what was coming in chapter 3. Let's review just briefly how we got here. God, as he states in his word, created the world in six literal days. He rested on the seventh day which we remember now was God establishing a picture in that day of rest, that day of ceasing. And that picture was that only through God's work do we have the opportunity for true rest. The Sabbath picture eventually being fulfilled in Jesus' work on the cross and our rest in that work. After chapter 1, we see him go back and re-describe the details of day 6 in chapter 2. So day 6 is really all of chapter 2. And in that day, we hear hear how he created two people who were clearly distinguished from the rest of his creation, unique in their construction and purpose. They enjoyed the benefit of an entire world created specifically for their use and for their enjoyment. They were granted a unique ability to relate to their creator and to respond to him. Their nature was free and innocent, and their purpose in creation was to glorify God by serving him serving in the garden specifically at their t- in their day, and by extension, serving God in our walk of life today. And in this innocent state, they lack the capacity to understand either good or evil in relationship to one another. Like someone who does not have an exposure to darkness has a trouble understanding what light is. Uh, the contrast is, is necessary to understand each. They lack that, which is a good thing. They were innocent to that. But then we looked at how God's purpose in the creation was ultimately going to be fulfilled through an opportunity for men and women to fall. God desires to express himself fully into a creation that is capable of understanding his nature and character and responding to that expression fully. And so God gave a simple, single prohibition to the man and woman, which becomes a test of their willingness to follow him fully in the day they live. It wasn't a trap, as we explained, and yet, without such a test, there could never have been a true relationship that understood God fully. It could never have understood that God is not only a God of mercy, but a God of wrath. It could never have understood that God is not only a God of judgment, but also a God of grace. They never could have understood the full nature and character of a God that must respond to sin. Now, man would have lived forever under those circumstances had he obeyed God. He would have been multiplying and filling the world as God commanded. He and his descendants would have been giving God glory through their service and enjoying God's caring provision throughout this time. That was the potential future that was set before man and woman. But yet God's own word and even his design of the world in chapters 1 and 2 reflect the expectation that things would not remain as he established them in the beginning. Remember Ephesians 1.4 reminds us that He chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world. That statement all in its own reflects the reality of God's expectation that there would be a fall, a fall necessitating a Messiah, a Messiah who would have to come and and die. And then in that relationship, some would receive the glory, would receive the grace rather that God offers be chosen in him. In other words, that in itself tells us God understood and anticipated the fall. Then we even looked at the design of the creation itself, the very reality that he puts a tree in the garden, that water was suspended and rain did not fall for a future day in which it would, that there was a sea picturing hell, that there was night picturing evil, 
elements in the very design of the creation which anticipate certain things happening, sin, the fall, and evil in the world. God preparing for that change, even in the way he designed creation initially. We also remember that when he recreates a new world, a world without sin in it in a future day, those elements are gone. No sea, no dark, none of the things which are called upon today to picture the evil of the world. So now that brings us to chapter 3. And today, as you might expect, will be a bit of an introduction to the chapter, a few verses, and setting the stage for what follows in future weeks. Now, in this chapter, and you know it, I'm sure, at least I assume you do, you find the fall of man from this place of privilege, the, the one of, if not maybe the most important chapter in the Bible, for what it says about all that follows in the book. But this ch- chapter is also a place where redemption begins. If I were to ask the average Christian or even just the average man on the street, what is the theme, what is the purpose of chapter 3, I suspect most answers would come around the issue of the fall. True enough. But the truth is, the real answer is, that chapter 3 is the beginning of redemption. Chapter 3 is where God sets out the plan to redeem men. In this chapter, we're going to also see the way sin works. I hope you'll notice as we go through it, and I'll point it out, there's a very important subtext to the chapter. How does sin work? How does evil work? How does temptation work? If you want to solve those issues in your own life by the power of the Spirit, the first step is understanding how they work. And then secondly, we're going to take a look at the techniques of the enemy himself and his methods, his modus operandi. Going into chapter 3, there's one verse we still need to cover out of chapter 2. And I count it part of 3 because it's really Moses' transition between 2 and 3. It's the last verse of chapter 2, so let's begin there. Chapter 2, verse 25, Moses writes, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. There's a sermon. Moses brings this bridging verse. It bridges chapter 2 into chapter 3. The Hebrew word for naked is arom, A-R-O-M. If we glance ahead just to chapter 3, verse 1, you'll see the word crafty being used, at least in my English version, crafty to describe the serpent. The word in Hebrew for crafty is arom. And I'm emphasizing the vowel difference. Arom, arom. But in Hebrew, they sound almost identical. They're pronounced with very little distinction. And to the Hebrew ear, it's an obvious play on words. Moses is using the similarity of these two words to draw a connection, to draw a bridge between the two chapters and the events of the two chapters. Moses is contrasting the innocence of man and woman in their early state with the sinister nature of the enemy who now comes on the scene at the beginning of chapter 3. Why do this? Why even mention, for example, that they're naked? Or why mention that they can be naked in each other's presence and feel no shame over that? Well, Moses is connecting something here that is fundamental to understanding not only what happens in chapter 3, but actually everything about our lives today since the fall. He's connecting evil with our tendency to be ashamed of nakedness. Have you noticed that? By the way, I don't think it's something that takes a lot of explanation, but generally speaking, we don't feel comfortable being naked. Most people have to sort of overcome that if they have some reason to be naked, right or wrong. Now, we think sometimes in terms of culture. Well, you know, there's people in other parts of the world that wear hardly anything, and they don't seem to have any problem with it. Okay. But have you ever found a culture where it's natural, it's expected that you wear nothing? The degree of clothing is not the issue here. The issue is, why do we feel the need for any? Especially if we live in a climate where there's really no need for that kind of protection or or for warmth, for example. And yet it's universal. It's absolutely universal. We've never come upon a culture, in my, in my research anyway, in which the natural state that you find the culture in is clothless. There's always something, even if it's minimal. You ever thought to ask why that is? Anthropologists might give answers. Sociologists might give answers. But none of them actually get to the fundamental question of why isn't it different? The Bible gives us that answer. It's a spiritual issue. And it's one that I'm not prepared to address today because it will come up toward the end of this chapter. So we'll come back to the question of why were they able to be without clothing, or maybe the better way to phrase it is, why is their shame or lack thereof connected to their state of clothedness? Why are those two connected? What's more important to understand at this point is, notice their relationship. The man and woman could be naked in each other's presence without shame, picturing something very important, picturing transparency, 
and vulnerability. Transparency and vulnerability. I'll give you a quick understanding of what I'm talking about. Transparency is simply a relationship that is true and completely honest. True and complete honesty in a relationship. Whether before God or whether with one another, one another in a relationship, we live in a transparent way when we speak and act with no intent to keep any part of ourselves hidden. That would be the best definition I could offer you of transparency. Literally, you could say we have nothing to hide. Nothing to hide. Notice there's two kinds of relationships when we talk transparency. I can have transparency with God, and I can have transparency with other people. Now, I will tell you, from God's point of view, there is perfect transparency. There is nothing hidden. But in our actions, in our words, in our willingness to confess sin before him, in our willingness to submit to his will in our life, we can, and we often do and usually do, live at something less than full transparency. And more than that, with our neighbors, friends, brothers and sisters in the Lord, we are absolutely not living with transparency. I have yet to meet a human being who is living in pure transparency with their friends. True transparency is a byproduct of holiness, of having nothing to hide. Only someone who is truly right before God can live in a truly transparent manner before him. That was the state of Adam and woman at this point in chapter 3. Now, after the fall, conversely, we lose the ability to live with transparency with one another and with God because we lack complete holiness. Because we've lost transparency with God, therefore we are no longer able to have transparency with one another. Now, it's not that hard to understand how that works, right? When are you prone to hiding something with one another or with a spouse or with a parent? When does the feeling of hiding something usually come? When we've done something wrong, when we know we'll upset them, when we know they won't be pleased with our behavior. But if you understand the holiness of God in relationship to our own lack of holiness, if you understand his standards are so much higher than ours, if you understand there is a judgment awaiting those who do not come to the Lord in grace, then transparency is literally impossible before the judge. You can't create your own holiness apart from God's grace But you can move toward a more holy walk with the Lord by pursuing transparency. But having his grace in faith, you can now advance the cause of holiness in your life by looking for ways to be transparent. How many of you all have heard or maybe been taught at some point in time that it's good to have a partner that we sometimes call an accountability partner, accountability friend or or brother or sister in the Lord? A lot of us have heard the term, I don't meet many people who have that relationship in truth really deeply, honestly. And what I'm talking about now is someone who knows you so well, they know all your faults to the the extent you've revealed them, that they're not waiting for you to confess. They're asking you before you say anything. Uh, As an example, someone who has a, a particular problem with, let's say, pornography, which unfortunately is common in many places today. A true transparency with a accountability partner would mean that the person with the problem would have confessed the problem fully, And then the transparency is maintained by the partner calling them regularly, checking on them regularly and saying, how's it going? How are you dealing with this? How's it been progressing? Are you still praying about it? Have you had any falls lately? Is there anything you need to tell me? And that that continual drawing out of transparency is not only going to bring to light issues that need to be addressed, of course, but it's going to cause a new way of thinking in the mind of the person with the issue. It's in keeping with what Christ says to the apostles when he says, nothing that is secret will remain hidden, that there will be a day in which all secrets that we keep in our heart are going to be revealed. I can tell you that if you know you're going to get caught, you're less likely to do it. You know that feeling, that thinking? When I know I can't keep something secret forever, I'm less likely to try. And if I have an accountability partner who is concerned about my welfare enough that they're reaching into my life and asking fundamental questions, pointed questions, then the next time I'm tempted to take that step I know I can't take, I'm going to remember, you know, I'm going to have to talk to somebody about this when I do this. And that may be enough. That may be God's will through the Spirit to direct us into a conviction moment ahead of the sin and cause us to think twice. That's a practical way in which transparency can be useful in the body of Christ. But the issue here in chapter 3 is one more fundamental to that than that. They are currently in a state of pure transparency before God. They have nothing to hide because they have no sin. And you notice it's a transparency to God first that allows a transparency to one another second. That's the state in which 
they begin. And as I said, we'll address the clothing connection later. But at this point, it's enough to note the men, man and woman here are living without shame because they were made in an innocent fashion. We today do not live in that state. We have sin, and so we share the shame of that sin, and we see it close around us as a barrier to transparency. We need to fight against that barrier by the will of God through the Spirit. So now looking at Genesis 3, from that bridge, Moses now opens up, as I said, one of the most important chapters in Scripture. Beginning in verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Now, there's several things to address here even before we move further. At some point, man and woman are confronted by a serpent in the garden that's been created. This event, we know, happens after the first week, after day seven. We don't know how long after day seven. That's not given in the text. But we can make some assumptions. Let's start with who is the serpent. Well, we know it's Satan, and that's not even hard to come to as a conclusion because of what Scripture gives us elsewhere. I'll read a few examples. Revelation 12:9. it says, The great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And then later in that same book, Revelation 20, verse 2, it says, And he lay hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. The scriptures say that the one referred to in the earlier time, the old time, as serpent, was Satan, was the devil. John 8:44 calls him the father of lies. Jesus speaking in 8:44 says, You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father, talking to the Pharisees. He, the, the devil, was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's who we're talking about here. When we say the serpent, we're talking about the enemy, the devil. But the question that comes to mind for every Bible student at about this point is, is this then intended to suggest he's standing there in the form of literally a snake? Or is it more metaphorical, just describing him as a serpent? Well, the Hebrew word in for this animal, nakash, it is literally the word for snake, for serpent, commonly translated as such, we can assume, or we can conclude, rather, that it was, in fact, a physical snake because of what's said next. This is an animal more crafty than any beast of the field. In other words, it's, con it's included by reference as one of the beasts of the field. That would further conclude or further support the conclusion that we're looking at a literal snake. So the natural reading of the text is the woman saw a snake who was also Satan who spoke to her. Now what does Moses, Moses mean then when he says the snake is more crafty than any other beast? That's probably another point of contention for people. What does it mean that he's saying he's more crafty? Is Moses saying the snake as God created snakes is just naturally a sneakier and nastier animal than any other animal? Well, I can tell you from personal experience that is not true because God also made poodles. <laughs> the mere existence of poodles just wipes out that conclusion altogether. No, he's telling us something particular about this snake, about this snake. This particular serpent, the one standing before even the moment, was craftier than all creatures. This is Moses' very subtle, artful way of explaining that this snake was different than any other snake or any other beast because Satan was indwelling it. That's what made it so crafty. That's what made it so special. What Moses is saying is, this snake, because it's indwelt by Satan, was different. Let me give you an analogy to help you understand what I'm saying. We know that in, last, in the last days, there will be a man who rules the earth politically, who we will call, the Bible calls, the Antichrist. But he is a physical man, a human being who rises to power. And at a point in his reign, he becomes indwelt by Satan. And in the same sense here as you have an ordinary snake turned into a very special snake because of Satan's indwelling, similarly in the last days we will have a man who is the most evil of all men 
and warrants this special title, Antichrist, purely because of Satan's influence directly in his life. That's the sense of what Moses is saying when he says the most crafty of all animals of the, or, or beasts of the field. It indicates this combination of a special, abnormal, heightened intelligence mixed with evil. But now to the question you're really wondering, why does he take the form of a snake? Why bother with the whole snake part? Why not just be Satan? Why not just stand there as an angel of light? Well, first, there's no indication that the snake was chosen for any particular reason. So we don't need to read that into the text. We don't need to assume that there was something about the snake that made it the perfect animal for Satan. Had Satan chosen to indwell a poodle, for example, today we'd be saying that poodles were the most crafty of any other beast of the field. That would be the natural way we conclude, and how appropriate would that be? Satan has to take some form when he appears before Adam and woman. He can take his own natural form as spirit. What is our experience when angels appear to men? Keeping in mind that he is demonic, but that just means he's fallen, he's still an angel. What's the natural response men have to the appearance of an angel? Today it's fear, which I believe is driven by that transparency issue, by the fact that there is sin. But it is certainly one in which they would see, we would see such an apparition, such a presentation, as supernatural and from God, from the spirit realm. That's the consistent natural reaction. That is the universal reaction in Scripture when men see angels, good or bad. Well, what is Satan's purpose in this encounter? His purpose in this encounter is to set himself as an ally to man and woman with a common enemy who he will portray to be God. Well, it serves his purpose to come in the form of creation if his purpose is to align with man and woman. It is counter to his purpose if he reveals himself to be of the spirit realm, to be godlike or to be supernatural. So his purpose is altogether in, involved in the choice he's making here to come in a simple form, an appealing form, and a form that presents no concerns and fits his purpose. This is what Paul means when Paul says that he comes as an angel of light. When Paul uses that reference, he is not describing necessarily the literal form that Satan takes every time. He's talking figuratively about Satan's purpose always being to present himself to us in an appealing way, in a way that seems unthreatening, that seems natural, that seems attractive. Sometimes it could literally be an angel of light. I believe that's what Joseph Smith saw when he believes he saw the angel Moroni. He saw an angel of light, as he described it. My belief is that he saw Satan or a, or a demonic angel. But in other cases, he'll come as a snake, if that suits his purpose. So why doesn't the woman run screaming when she sees a talking snake? Isn't that the natural thing we would expect? Oh, you're just going to have a conversation with a talking snake? Doesn't that give you warning signs? Talking snake, talking snake. Well, it suggests that the encounter with Satan happens very early in the creation, wouldn't it? Before woman and man have explored the world sufficiently to come to an understanding, hey, that you know what, I've noticed the animals never say anything. Animals don't seem to talk. They don't seem to relate to God the way we do. We're unique. Based on Adam's experience naming the animals on day six, he would have known that a talking animal was an anomaly. He should have understood out of that experience that they are not suitable. They're in a different level than, the, than, than mankind is. But if you notice, he's not really engaged in this moment. So a woman may not have had that same understanding. The naming process took place before her existence. So from woman's point of view, look, another thing that talks. Isn't this interesting? Maybe that explains why he goes to her first. We'll come back to that question later. Before we go any further in the storyline, let's ask an even more fundamental question that I think is important to understanding the rest of the chapter. Where did Satan come from? When I mean, we have him now standing in the garden with a snake form, talking to a woman, but that just begs the question, where is he? I haven't seen him anywhere in the previous two chapters, so when did he appear, much less become who he is? And we know since he's not mentioned in the creation story, we'd have to go elsewhere in the scriptures to find out. We do know from other scripture, number one, that he existed in the garden before he fell. Ezekiel makes this point in a short passage that God writes through Ezekiel, talking to Satan about his history. It's one of the best places and, and main places we go in Scripture to hear the history, the backstory on Satan. Ezekiel 28 is the chapter. It's a great chapter for looking at it. I'll start and read in chapter 28, verse 12, just a few verses. Verse 12 begins, Son of man, this is God speaking to Ezekiel, 
Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre. And that's a reference to Satan, and you'll see more of that here in a moment. And say to him, thus says the Lord God, you have the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis, lazuli, the uh, turquoise, sorry, and the emerald. And the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. On the day he was created, all those things were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. And therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God. And I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. Now, there isn't everything we want to know there, but there's some interesting detail. First, he was in the garden, it says. And he was created on that day. The natural reading of Ezekiel 28, 13 is you were in the garden, you were in Eden. On the day you were created, that's when all these things were prepared. Now, that's my reading of the text. That's not a universal view, and I wouldn't get dogmatic over it. But if that's true, then his fall takes place also somewhere after day six. And then as a result of his fall, he is now in a position of condemnation. He's under God's uh, wrath. And judgment. There is an alternative theory, one that fits into the gap theory, which I won't retell here, but if you remember it from previous weeks, the theory that there is a span of time between Genesis 1 1 and Genesis 1 2 that's not accounted for in Scripture. And then the theory is that it's in between those two moments that Satan fell and that there was an earlier stage in which the garden existed and he was in the garden and he fell, and because of his fall, God wipes out the garden and wipes out the earth. And then begins again in chapter 1, verse 2. Again, something you can uh, come to and believe if you choose to. It's not a tremendously important distinction if you do or don't. More importantly, though, notice that evil exists before man's sin. Satan's fall produced the arrival of evil as the father of lies. And then he becomes the instrument for initiating man's fall. He's still given access to man and woman. Why did God allow Satan to remain in the garden and tempt man and produce the fall? Would there have been a fall without Satan tempting Eve, without tempting woman? Would we have ever come to that point? Well, we'll examine that question, as I said a little later. But for now, remember, God has anticipated and prepared for the fall from the beginning. Now, look at Satan's attempt to bring this fall about. He begins with a question. And as we look at this question in the dialogue that follows, and we have just a few minutes left, let's just start to see a pattern that we'll examine fully in weeks to come. Satan asks, has indeed God said? Without the single prohibition that exists, where would Satan have started this conversation? Had God never given Adam a prohibition, had God never said you will not do something, Satan would never have had anything to challenge. The very fact that God puts this tree in the garden, followed by a prohibition concerning that tree, gives opportunity now for Satan to have a conversation around this one issue. Without a tree and without the commandment concerning the tree, there is no starting point for disobedience. Paul makes essentially that same point in Romans. In Romans 4.15, Paul says, For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is no violation. The law that Adam had was a single law. Don't eat out of that tree. That's it. That's his law. But without that law, there could be no violation. But now that there is law, violation is possible. Satan begins his question by saying, indeed, has God said. It sounds like a question, but actually, when you think about it, it's a statement. He's implying that God has treated them unfairly. But do you notice where he goes first? Indeed, has God said to the law, to the word, to God's prohibition, to specifically God's instructions, that's where he goes first. And he says, is it true that God said this? What he's implying, though, of course, is that he's taking you for a ride. He's 
He's given you something to your disadvantage. He's made you a fool. He's made you feel naive, hasn't he? Did you realize that he put one over on you when he said that? Those are my words, but that's the sense of it. That's the feel of it. He impugns God's motives. Has indeed God said. Try that phrase with somebody and see what they think. Have indeed you told me that. I mean, you, you can see the sense of it right away. It's not going to be taken well. His method here, look at his method briefly. It's to bring us to a place where we doubt God's character and purposes by questioning his word. Is it any mystery that in our day and age, the creation story of Genesis is easily the most maligned part of the Bible? If you get the beginning wrong, virtually nothing else matters. And we go directly to the point of what God has said, maligning his motives, criticizing its truthfulness, and then building a, a story from there. But look at Satan's technique even further. Cleverly, he allows us to fill in the blank with our own accusation against God. He doesn't make the accusation. He, se- he seeds the doubt and lets us fill in the blanks. This is the way the father of lies works. He will use suggestion to weaken our resolve and ultimately our obedience. Suggestion. Doubt. Question. And then look at the answer the woman gives. And this will be the thing we really pick up next week or in, 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 in the next teaching. But notice the woman's answer. It's interesting that she seems ready to have a natural conversation with a snake, but then again, that's okay if we understand she didn't know any different at this point in creation. But her answer is initially a defense of God's word. What's so interesting about that is she, unlike what her husband will do shortly later, she runs to a defensive moment. She runs into the gap and tries to support what she's heard from God. Her first thought is, I've got to defend God's word. Then she begins to give what she remembers as the instructions. She repeats what she believes God's instructions are. Does she get it right? Well, a good Bible student would quickly say no. The question then is how? How did she get it wrong? Well, first, she makes God's word more restrictive than it was. But at the same time, she neglects an emphasis of freedom that God gave in his statement while de-emphasizing the penalty. She tones down the penalty. She says, we will die, not we will surely die. And not in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. She fails to emphasize the freedom. You can eat of any tree in the garden. And then she makes it more restrictive by saying she's not allowed to touch it as well as eat it, which God never said anything about. So we know woman here is familiar with God's word, but obviously she's not intimately familiar. She's not familiar enough to get it right. Let me leave you with this as a first point among several we'll make later on what happens when we face the temptation and the schemes of the enemy without a strong enough understanding of God's word. What do you assume happens? It's counterintuitive what actually happens because what we assume happens is we get more liberal. The assumption is that when we don't know God's word and we're faced with a moment of decision, we will tend to be more liberal, more likely to do the wrong thing. And actually, this example and the testimony of Scripture and the history of mankind argues for the opposite conclusion. When religious-minded people depart from God's word, they tend to make up or invent their own rules and ideas, calling them God's rules and ideas, and substitute theirs for God's. And the end effect of that is, we don't tend to make God's word less restrictive, we actually tend to make it more restrictive. When you don't know the word, you run to legalism. It doesn't go there in one day, but it goes there. Legalism is a man-made restriction masquerading as God's law. And it is the natural instinct of a religiously-minded person who is unfamiliar with God's word, to make up rules when we don't know what the rules are. It makes God, in the end, to be an unkind taskmaster intent on robbing us of joy. That's the inevitable impression that it leaves people with. It leads them to resentment and frustration, and ultimately it drives them away from a loving God. Because their impression is, this is a God who doesn't want to let me have any fun. Now, that is not to say that everything we want to do is right, but it is to say that when we go to God's word, he will counsel us to the proper understanding of what is righteousness with an understanding that in love he gives us these expectations. When we rely on man-made rules, it is all just legalism. It's all cold and dry and hard. Every word of Scripture matters, and when we change even a small part of it, we depart from God's path and we're left on our own. 
I'll end with Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6. It says, every word of God is tested and he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words or he will reprove you and you will be proved a liar. Do you notice it doesn't say don't take away? God knows the problem is we add more than we take away in most cases. And when our memory fades, what the enemy is ready to do is run into that gap and insert our, his own meaning and confuse our understanding. And then as that process takes hold, we will question God's motives and wonder whether he had our best interests at heart. And the antidote is a lifelong pursuit of God's word. We'll come back at that next time uh, and study the rest of this chapter. We're going to continue to map out what is it that we do in the face of sin and what is the antidote. Let's go with me in prayer as we finish today. Heavenly Father, please, Father, I ask as we've studied this morning, you would give us a a greater understanding of how, in study of your word and knowledge of it, we can be prepared for the moment when the enemy may try to take us off the path. I pray, Father, we would be diligent in that study, but not merely for the sake of puffing ourselves up with a knowledge that does no good in our heart. There are plenty of men and women who do that, Father, and we don't desire to be counted among them. We ask, Father, that in our prayer life, in our study time, and in our fellowship with those in the faith, you would call us to live a life that is transparent and holy and focused on serving you and attentive to your word so that we may please you in our life and reach many others for the sake of the gospel and without the taint of legalism or self-righteousness that so often will drive them away. Father, please help us to be like you, showing love first. Watch over us this week. Bring us closer to your will and let us return in in our plans for a future Sunday. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.